OK, so one of the things that we've done so far is basically develop this basic, very basic picture of solid state devices and the way the carriers behave. So the next thing we do, we are trying to, we saw that we can actually create different regions of the semiconductor with different behavior in terms of the carrier densities, the holes and electrons. Now we've got to make a device. We've got to actually design something with it. So the first device we'll design is the PN junction diode, which is actually the simplest thing. If you think about if you can make regions with more electrons than holes, N type, and regions with more holes than electrons, the P types, well, the first device that you probably would want to make has some interesting characteristic would be a piece of N and a piece of P attached to each other. So if you think about them as a P, you already make a P type material by introducing some, let's say, dopants in the, and you know, some acceptors in the material, dopants, and then you make some N type with some donors, then, and if you could put them together, you will make the PN junction. Now, we don't make PN junctions that way, just so that we know. We actually make them out of a single piece of silicon. If you actually do it that way, it would be a really, really bad PN junction if any functional one at all. But that's the way we think about it to just process it. So we are thinking about PN junctions. And we want to understand how they behave, because they are the basis for the more sophisticated, more complex devices that will come later, that we'll use quite frequently. And of course, PN junctions are diodes, and then we'll, we'll also use them too. So what is a PN junction? So let's start thinking about a PN junction. So let's say you have two pieces of semiconductor. So right now, I'm keeping them separate, let's say. And there's a P type, and there's an N type. Now, what do we have in a p-type semiconductor? What does it look like? Well, you have a whole bunch of semiconductors, let's say silicon or other materials, atoms, and few, much smaller number, of what we call the dopants. These are the atoms we introduce to change the ratio of the electrons and holes. So in the p-type, we have the acceptors, which are basically third column ele uh, elements. And they basically, you can think about them. So we are starting at 0 Kelvin. So let's say we are at 0 Kelvin, at absolute 0. Now, at absolute 0, nothing is ionized. Every electron is attached to its associated atom, and they're in the 0 state. So what you have is basically, you can think about this as a bunch of negatively charged ions with associated holes with them, right? So you can think about this as a bunch of ions. So this is going to take me a second to do, and I'm going to cheat. Just bear with me for a second. This is as exciting for me as it is for you. Uh, OK, so now you have these negatively charged ions. So let's use a different color, actually. Uh, so at this point, at 0 Kelvin, nothing is ionized, right? So let's say these are negatively charged ions that have a hole attached to them. Basically, means that they are not ionized. There are third column elements that are not ionized. And then you have, and then we show, of course, these uh, positive charges here that are attached to them. OK? And then on the other side, on the n-type side, we also have these positively charged ions, which have an electron attached to them. Basically, it means that they are at 0 Kelvin. They are not ionized. And then you have the negatively charged um, uh, the electrons attached to them. So nothing is ionized, not very exciting. And what would the energy level look like? So, so now that we're done with the really exciting part, uh, 
we can get on with our business. So what does the energy level, what do the energy levels look like at for in the in the P side at zero Kelvin? Let's think about it. So you of course have the two energy bands, right? The conduction band and the valence band. So this is the valence band, this is the conduction band. This is the edge of obviously, you know what from now on, we'll always show it as a line, but by this, what we mean is that the conduction band is above this, and by this, we mean that the valence band is underneath it. And this is the band gap, so just keep that in mind. So I draw a line, but it really means the, the border, the edge of the band. So where is the Fermi energy at zero Kelvin? So you remember the number of carriers, for example, was given by Ni e to the ef minus ei over kt. We, did, we derived this in the previous lectures. And then p was ni e to the ei minus ef over kt. Now, at this temperature, there's nothing ionized, right? So your energy level is basically where your ei is, right? Because you're at the ni of that temperature. So basically, your Fermi energy is in the middle more or less. And the same thing here. And where are the acceptor levels? So acceptor levels, energy levels, are here. And they are not ionized. So they are just sitting there. Now, and the same thing is true here on this side. So if I have the conduction band and the valence band here, now my half, I have my donor levels, E donor, but they are not ionized. My Fermi energy is here. And I'm in thermal equilibrium. Nothing is happening. Fine. So right now I'm treating them as two separate pieces of semiconductors, right? So now let's say we actually attach them, which is another way of saying that they were made together anyway to begin with. And we'll see later on how they're made, but so that's basically when they be attached. When we attach them, nothing exciting happens. This is here, this is here, this is there, this is the junction. That's the energy level. Those are the energy levels at zero Kelvin. It's flat. Nothing is happening. Now, let's say you gradually heat it up. You gradually increase the temperature. What's going to happen now? So add, so go ahead. Ionization? Yes, exactly. Some of the donors and acceptors start getting ionized. So basically what it means in this picture is that some of these guys will start being ionized. And I'm removing them to just put them somewhere else, essentially, just at some random places. And then here we have the, um, them appear in other random places. Now, as this ionization happens, so you will have what? You will have more electrons on this side. I'm sorry, more holes on this side and more electrons on that side. Now you have electrons, free electrons. These are free electrons and free holes. So what happens as this is going on, as this goes on? Think about that. Now you have two things attached. On one side you have a bunch of electrons and you have on the other side you have a bunch of holes. And now they're not just stationary. They are moving around. Why? Because of their thermal energy, right? They have thermal energy, and they're very light. So a little bit of thermal energy gives them a lot of speed. So they're going to start bouncing around as soon as they're released. So when they're bouncing around, there's a chance that this hole will end up on the other side every so often. And there's a chance that an electron from this side will end up on the other side. And when an electron from the n type ends up in this side, what happens? What is, the, what, is the, what is the situation like? So you have an electron in the midst of a very large C, reasonably large number of holes. So the chance of it hitting a hole is pretty high. So at some point, these guys, there's a good chance that the electrons that end up on the other side will recombine, will find a hole, and they, they hit each other, and they recombine. And the same thing is true about the holes on this side. So gradually what happens, and this is most likely to happen where? At the borderline, right? So gradually your border starts getting depleted of 
these charge carriers. So you gradually start forming a region, which is basically the free charge carriers are gone because as soon as they end up in this region, there's more probable, there's higher probability of them just recombining with the opposite carriers. Now, this is a complete random process. I've heard this being explained at times as, yeah, the electrons see that there's less electrons on the other side, so they go to the other side, or the holes see. That. See, electrons are pretty dumb. They're not that smart. Right? Um, so they're just moving randomly around. And what happens is that they just kind of end up on the other side, and there's a higher chance of recombination on the other side, because there are a lot of chances for recombinations. There's a lot of opportunities for that. Yes, question. What, do you mean, what about the fusion? So what about the fusion? So the question is, what about the fusion? There are less electrons here, there are some electrons here, so it's going to flow here. So it's not that random. This is the fusion. The random thermal movement of electrons is the fusion. Actually, in this explanation, I actively stay away from the word diffusion, purposefully. Because I want exactly to, to people, kind of to, to, for people to realize that there's nothing magical happening about it. This random thermal movement is, in fact, a diffusion. But I don't call it diffusion because I want people to not to think that this is something very fancy or special. This is a very, very simple thing happening. Now, the fusion equation describes the flow due to random thermal movement? Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, what does it look like in terms of the energy? Yes, that's what we're going to do next. Great, good, great question. So, it, one before, so the next question is, the question was, how does it look like in terms of energy band diagrams? And so let's, let's find out. So, but for that to have to think about, uh, for, for that to, to be found out, just let's think about one thing. Now, once this region is formed that's mostly depleted of carriers, and we are showing it kind of like an, like an abrupt thing, but it's really a transition. It's a gradual thing. But this abrupt transition is a good approximation, and we'll know why we'll s soon. But it really goes back to this exponential. Because you have an exponential drop, and the exponential drops happen really rapidly. So it basically, this, it's called a depletion approximation. That you can just basically assume that this is a well-defined region. It's a pretty good approximation because of this exponential. But going to this thing, what is happening here? What is going on here in this region? What do you have? You have a little bit of an electric field, right? Because now you have positively charged ions here that cannot move. They're stuck. They're bound, they're tied down. And the same thing here with negatively charged. So what happens to the electric field? There is an electric field, right? These are all interesting and faint. So there's, a, there's an electric field built in. Oh, this one's a little bit better. Um, OK, so what does this electric field do to this process? Now, does it facilitate this random movement of electrons from one side to the other and the holes from one side to the other? Or does it impede? Think about it. Now, if there's an electric field here in this direction, is it easier for a positive charge to go from this side to that side? Does it experience a re resistive force, a repelling force? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, yeah. So it's like, yeah, go back. We were here first. And it's, a, and it's this guy. So it's a, oh, no, no, go back, right? So there's a built-in potential. So now let's see how it's reflected in the energy band diagram. So now still, there's no external potential applied to this thing. This is just sitting there. Now the energy band diagram, so if it's sitting there and it's in thermal equilibrium, one thing needs to be constant across this thing, which is the Fermi energy, right? So now what happens is that we said there's some ionization happening on this side. So we are at T above 0 Kelvin, but still below room temperature. So there's some ionization happening. And, oops, sorry, the other way. 
Um, so this is the end term. Okay. I did some poor planning in my drawing, but it's okay. Okay, so here you have a Fermi energy that looks like the band gap really doesn't change. The band gap is a property of the material. What is happening here is that now the Fermi energy is getting closer to the conduction band on this side because this is n type and it's getting closer to the valence band on the other side. Let me just make this a little bit less like that because we are not still at room temperature. So, and what's happening to the other energy level? So you had the EI, the intrinsic energy level. So you can see here, EF is above EI, the intrinsic energy level, which is kind of like halfway through. It's not exactly in the middle of the conduction band and valence band, but it's kind of close. And the reason it's not half exactly in, mid in the middle is that the energy states, the density of states and this state and that state, the NC and NV are not exactly the same. So here, this gap remains the same. I try to keep it the same more or less. It may not be exactly the same. The band gap. The Fermi energy remains constant across the thing. So this is our Fermi energy. Fermi level. And here what you see is that on this side, you have EI that's greater than EF. So what you will have? What will you have? You will have a lot more P's, holes, than N's, right? And on this side, you have EF that's above EI. So you will have a larger number of electrons. So there's this built-in electrostatic potential as a result of this thing. So there's this, there's this built-in potential that's there. Part of it is on the P side, and part of it is on the N side. So we can actually even give it a name and calculate it. So we can say this is psi um, Q psi P, and this is Q psi N. Now, psi, psi is basically measured in voltages, and this is electric. This is this is the energy, right? So we want to convert from the net energy to the electric voltage. You have to scale by the charge, so that's why there's a Q term there. So this is the way it looks like, and now. The energy band diagram for, for this. Now, as the temperature goes to the room temperature, so let's say it goes to the room temperature, what happens is that at room temperature, this ion, these dop dopants, the donors and acceptors, are completely ionized. And as a result, what happens is that you will be in a situation where these are a little bit farther up, and the Fermi energy close to these bands. And with respect to the acceptor and donor energy, so this is where the acceptor, ener uh, acceptor energy levels are. And this is where the donor energy levels are. Where's the, what was the appropriate color for that? I don't know. So at that point, you have formed a slightly larger depletion region. Let's say like this. And you have basically an ionization happening in this region, and you have an electric field built in. So now let's look at this energy band diagram, see if it makes sense. It seems to show that this side is higher than that side. But if you think from an energy perspective, if you take a positive charge, if I move it, is it harder to move it from this side to that side, or is it from left to right or from right to left? So it's easier to move it from right to left, right? Because the electric field will help it. So it, this appears to be upside down, right? Because it should be the other way around. It should be downhill going from here to there. But it looks uphill. Why? So this is a common question, common confusion. I'm just, yes? Because those are Correct. These are the energies of electrons. These are the energy band diagrams of the energy band diagrams of band energies of the electrons. And electrons are negatively charged. So for an electron, it is 
hard to go uphill this way. It's uphill this way. Because it's opposed, you see, it's going away from this positive charge that it likes, and it have to go to these negative charges that are repelling it. So these are energy band diagrams for the electrons, the energy levels for electrons. So, so that's why they're upside down, because electrons are negatively charged. Fine. But so other than that, this should make sense. Now, what happens? Does, does this process stop once the depletion region is formed? If you think about it, the depletion region is formed. Let's say we are at room temperature. There's a depletion region, and it's there. So everything is static. Everything is sitting there. Nothing is happening. No, right? There are electrons moving around very rapidly still, right? So there's still a chance that an electron will jump from this side to that side and recombine. And the same thing for a hole, because some of them still have enough energy. Some of them are hot enough to just jump from this side to the other, cross this potential barrier. Because see, this is uphill for the electrons, and this is also uphill for the holes. So the holes want to go this way, but this is their uphill, if you flip it upside down. So what, does it, what happens? Does it mean that the depletion region keeps growing and growing and growing and growing? No, doesn't make sense, right? Why, what stops it from growing? What is the thing that opposes this process? Because once they're on this side, they're going to recombine and they're going to go away, right? Which means that you're losing more electrons from this side and losing more holes from that side. There must be something that counters this process. Yes? Like thermal generation of Correct. Thermal, thermal generation of electron hole generation, particularly in the depletion region. Because yes, this is depleted because they moved here and they're close to the hostile region. They will just get absorbed most of the times. But it, there's nothing that says that every so often, because of the thermal energy, an electron cannot jump from here to there, from, a conduction band, from valence band to the conduction band. So when that happens, you will, what do you have? You have a hole and you have an electron, right? Right? So you have a hole and you have an electron. So which way would they go? Downhill. This one will go this way. This guy will go that way. Their downhill is different, but the electric field will just basically, if you look at the electric field, you see that's the direction they will go. Now, is this opposing the flow? Yes, because now there's a flow of electrons back to the n-type and a flow of holes back to the p-type region. So in steady st in, in equilibrium and steady in steady state as well by, by definition, if you have you know, thermal equilibrium, uh, what happens is that you are that this this current this generation thermal generation current is going to oppose the diffusion current. Now, what is that? Where is that diffusion current that we talked about earlier comes from? What is that thermal energy current coming from? Because if you think about it, these electrons on the p side on the n side have a Fermi Dirac distribution, which we said for energy levels that are sufficiently far away from the Fermi level, which is 3 kT, which is not that much, 75 millivolts or 75 milli electron volts, if you're talking about energy, you can use Boltzmann distribution, which is basically an exponential. So if you think about it, these guys, there are still some of them that are hot enough. So they can go. But these folks who cannot do a jump over like a fence, they can just basically or bounce back. Okay? Now, and the same thing for the holes. So the holes also experience a similar situation. So there's a distribution of these guys, and these folks go through, and these are bounced back. Now, this current, this thermal current, is balanced in steady state completely by this generation current, by this process of electron holes generation, which goes back. Does this make sense? Qualitatively? Any questions on that before we move on? So what, is, what are these, some of these parameters, right? So, so let, let's, let's calculate some of these things. So first of all, what is this built-in potential? This, this built, we call this a built-in potential, right? Because there's an electric field difference. How can we calculate that? 
How can we calculate what this built-in potential is? Do you agree that this built-in potential is q psi n and q psi, psi n minus psi, psi p, right? Psi p minus n, or the sum of these two. So what is this one? Let's say psi p. What is it? Let's calculate that. If you say q psi p, which is basically the energy difference between the e, EF and EI, right? So it is going to be E, um, in this case, it would be EI minus EF for here on the P side. What is that? Do you, but look at this equation, or look at this equation perhaps, and tell me what that is. Well, you can solve for EI minus EF from this equation. Right? And use it there. So if we solve for that, what do we get? Now, we get P, which is the density of the holes in the bulk of the p-type. What is the density of the holes in the bulk of the p-type at room temperature? Na, right? Because you've doped it, and we said at room temperature, if you design, if you have the right kind of material, then all of them are ionized. The number of holes is essentially dictated by that density. So this is going to be Na. And this is going to be Nd also. So we know Na because we designed it to be what it is. So this is going to be kT natural log of N, um, Na over Ni, which is the intrinsic level. It's 1.45 10 to the minus 10 per cubic centimeter. It's a fixed amount, fixed quantity. So you know psi p. So psi p is basically q, uh, that divided by q the charge of the electrons. And then similarly for psi n, the built-in potential, electric potential on the other side, it's going to be EF minus EIN, this difference. And similarly from this, you can calculate what that is, which basically is going to be KT natural log of ND over NI. And therefore, psi n minus plus psi p, which is the sum of these two, is going to be kt over q. This is in volts, right? Na nd divided by ni squared. So this is the voltage. This is the voltage across this thing has to be equal, which is the sum of these two built-in potential, has to be equal to that. So this is the built-in potential. So this is the height of this barrier that gets built naturally when you actually have this random thermal movement. And you can calculate, these, these, these are known quantities, right? So you've designed it to have a certain doping level on the acceptor side, the, the P side, and the N type. And this is, an, these are, this is a constant of silicon. For example, for silicon, is 1.45 10 to the minus 10, 10, to the 10 uh, per cubic centimeter. These are physical constants and the temperature, right? So you can calculate the height of this electric poten built-in potential. So, and of course, this quantity, how many, what is this? What, how, much are, how many electrons are there that are hot enough that can go through? The number of these hot electrons that, are, that can still pass this potential barrier. What is it proportional to? You remember from last time, we did a calculation. We said that the number of electrons above a certain e, E1, or not charge carriers, in Boltzmann distribution was proportional to the e to the negative e1 divided by kt. That's Boltzmann distribution. Right? So this is proportional, the number of these things is proportional to the e to the negative. Now this is the potential barrier, e to the q psi naught divided by kt. Call this psi naught. Right? So that is the height of the potential barrier, which we calculated. So this, the number of electrons that can pass is proportional to that. So is the number of holes, because they also experience the same potential barrier height. So the barrier height is the same for both of them. Right? So it's proportional to that. And that has to be equal. So now that, whatever that is, that, that total number, has to be equal to the generation current. So this is also equal to generation current in steady state. Because they are in steady state. They are in thermal equilibrium. So all of that is nice and good. But it's not still particularly useful. Why it's not particularly useful? Because it just shows what it is in 
thermal equilibrium without any external influence. If you're making a device, we want to do something with it. And doing something with it in electrical engineering means applying electric voltage and currents to it. Right? So now let's see what happens if you apply some voltage to that. So we are going to stay with this picture and say, look, I'm not going to do all of those again. I'm just going to do a representative one. So you have negatively charged particles. OK, if I use, let's use the same color code. Negatively charged ions here, positively charged ions there. And here, and there. And then you have a bunch of free electrons and free holes going around. So we have the holes here, and then we have the electrons. Here, our energy band diagram looked like this. Fermi level is like this, initially, when we are in thermal equilibrium. And then that's the p-type. And this is the n-type. And the electric field is pointing this way. OK. So we're back here, but now we are going to do something. We are going to apply an external electric field to it. And I'm going to apply a voltage called, let's call it VD, the voltage across the diode, because this is a diode, well, as we'll see. So what happens if I apply a bias like this? By the way, is it a forward bias or a reverse bias, the way I've applied it? The positive is going to P. Positive is going to positive, negative is going to negative, so it's forward. So I'm forward biasing it from an electrical, from a circuit perspective. So what does that do to the potential barrier and the depletion region? If you think about the depletion region. Now, what, what does this do? So injecting positive charge into here and negative charge into here. So say again? Shrink the depletion region, right? Exactly, because you have now more electrons and holes that are available, so they can come in and just like fill up these empty spaces where they were kind of ionized before, so they can come in and be here and neutralize the charge here. So the electric field will go down. The potential barrier will be lowered. By how much? The potential barrier will be lowered by how much? QVD. QVD. Right? So what happens is that or, um, so this potential barrier now is lowered compared to before. So this is where it was before, and this is where it was before. Now it's lowered by QVD. So now remember, think, let's think about those charge carriers and the distribution. So before, you had this distribution, and these were the guys who could pass, right? These were proportional to e to the negative Q psi naught over kT. Now a whole bunch of new electrons can pass too, because now I've lowered the potential barrier. Right? So now that I've lowered the potential barrier by QVD, now how many can pass? So now, basically, all the stuff that's kind of happening is they're going to be proportional to the E to the psi naught minus VD over KT, the minus sign. So now all of them can pass. So th this is basically the whole thing, right? including those guys. So what is the net increase in the number that can pass? Do you agree that this, if this is this whole thing, and this is its top part, this net part is the difference of these two, proportional to the difference of these two. So the net flow of electrons, let's say Jn, is going to be proportional to the E so the Q psi naught minus VD over KT minus E to the negative Q psi naught over KT, which I can 
write as e to the negative q psi naught over kt times e to the neg e to the q vd over kt minus 1. And the same thing is true for the holes. If you think about the holes, so before, these were the ones that would go, which is proportional to that. But now, the, the new ones that can go are here. But the sum of these two is proportional to that. So the, the net new addition is this guy. This one, right? So this is the net extra current that can be carried by this thing. So this proportionality of the current, so that's also true for Jn. So the diode current, I, is going to be proportional to this quantity. Now, we give it a proportionality constant called Is, the saturation current. So it would be QVD over KT minus 1. So that's the equation that's used for a diode. That's a diode equation describing the current. And what you see, there's some, so OK, so. The equations, et cetera, et cetera. What is the takeaway from this? What's the meaning of this thing? PN junction diode does all the work because of the immense amount of thermal energy that is there in the electrons. It's just a way of utilizing that thermal energy. All you're just doing when you apply a forward bias, you're lowering the potential barrier, and they just pour in the electrons from one side and the holes from the other side. And the fact that they do it is because of the thermal movement. And you can imagine this will happen very quickly, right? So what happens is that you are just lowering the potential barrier by a small amount. But because of that exponential dependence of Boltzmann distribution, a whole lot more comes in. And that's why you have an exponential. And that's why you have a KT. Now, any device that you see whose equation of the IV characteristic or equation of the behavior described, the equation describing its behavior, contains a KT, is a thermal device. When you see KT, it means that it's really dominated by thermal. So PN junction device is really a way of harnessing that thermal energy and using it for carrying of the current. Okay? It's nothing magical. And now people use, make, make it more sophisticated, comp, try to make it more complicated by calling diffusion and drift, et cetera, et cetera. So there are two components to this thing. There's this thermal movement, and then there's that component in the middle, which is basically when there's a hole and electron generated in the middle, they go in the opposite direction, that's a drift. And that's basically what's being canceled here. That's what negative one is. A lot of times in design, especially if you have a forward bias device, you don't worry about this because this is an exponential, and then sometimes you just drop this. But now the interesting thing is that now what happens if, in, if it's in the reverse bias, if Vd is negative? So now let's think about the opposite situation, because we talked about the positive forward bias. And now what if it was negative, if it was reversed? So what would happen then? So help me out. Now the potential barrier, instead of being lowered, is increased. right? So the potential barrier now, instead of being here, would go up here. And in this situation, it will go down here. So now even fewer can go and jump through. So when the potential is barrier is high enough, all you will end up with is just the neg this component, negative of that, which is basically is the drift part. Because we said the drift part, the part that that generation part, is, has to be the same as this random thermal part. But now if you remove this random thermal part by, gener by creating a barrier that's larger, for the most part, you are left with that drift part, which is this part. Is that thermal generation? So this equation is also valid because if Vd is negative, then it becomes small at some point, sufficiently large in magnitude, then it becomes negative Is. So the IV characteristic of a PN junction diode does look like this. It's an exponential. And this is negative Is. Now, there are nuances here, right? I mean, this is a simplified view. There's much more nuances here. For example, as you apply a reverse bias, the depletion region width increases. So this current slightly increases. This is not completely flat. But as you will see, as we'll see shortly, is that that increase is not very large. And uh, it's, it's either 
a square root dependence or cubic root dependence and all those things. And that's, that, and that's why this is a reasonably good approximation of the behavior of the diet. Now remember, there are layers of approximations being built. And you will see as we go through the class, that one of the things, particularly when we get to the circuits part of it, that there are approximations upon additional approximation. And if things start bothering you, keep in mind that already we've gone through three layers or at least three levels of approximation to arrive at this thing, right? At least. Because we are looking at this behavior of electrons and we are capturing the behavior of electrons in a lattice and holes in the lattice. We are capturing it as some sort of an effective mass. And then we are taking that. And then we are just on top of that. We are making, assuming it's a Boltzmann distribution on top of a Fermi Dirac distribution. And then on top of that, we are making these assumptions about this depletion region is not changing, et cetera, et cetera. So don't get too hung up if we, on, on getting the exact equations solved sometimes. I mean, we have to do, sometimes we have to do it exact because if there's some effect. But remember, we already have like two or three layers of approximation. And a lot of these things is based on classical models, or semi-classical models. We are not using quantum electrodynamics to do the model this thing. And a lot of things are already there. So as we will go forward, we'll make more approximations. The point is to capture the essence of the behavior of something so you can design with it. If you make it too complicated, you will not be able to design with it. But also, you have to make it just sufficiently simple, not more, right? Anyway, um, so that's for that. Any questions? All right. Okay.